So here we are. We have the speech. It was very much about a healing narrative. It was about the, the power of democracy. But there was a nod in there. We will repair our alliances. Your first take, good morning, sir, on morning the speech you. by the new president. I thought it was a very different and a very encouraging tone. There was a lot more we than there was I. There was no talk of American carnage that we had four years ago. As you were pointing out just then, the message is democracy has prevailed. We've now got this raft of executive orders putting back some of the things that Trump had taken away or had broken. And we've got Jen Psaki, the new White House uh, spokesman, saying that we're going back to the days of truth and transparency. So the tone is very different, and I think it's a very encouraging message to people who were a bit uh, shell-shocked, shall we say, by some aspects of the Trump presidency. And as you say, in that speech, there's a message of reassurance to America's allies that this America will, of course, it'll look after America's interests, but it will not be in the same unilateralist kind of way, America first, and to hell with everybody else. OK, so we're, we're going to see a shift in that. And we already have a, a, in the executive orders on the World Health Organization, the Pli Paris Climate Agreement. But, Peter, I, yeah. I, I want to draw on your experience as the former ambassador. I look at Sajid Javid and what he wrote in The Telegraph, and this is what he said. Biden will see Brexit Britain for what it really is, his closest partner, actually, in defending. This is about the rules-based system. Uh, an independent UK will rely on its rules-based international system more than ever. So this is the former uh, Chancellor and Home Secretary. And, uh, of course, there was many fear that Britain would be relegated in importance, Sajid said, in terms of its position. But, of course, it is about that rules-based system that may draw us closer together, what binds us together. Your, your, your impression of Javid's uh, proposition? Well, Sajid has been very interested in American politics for a long time, and I'm glad to see him out there if you like, batting, batting for Brexit Britain. My own view is that for the incoming president, uh, the United Kingdom, I'm sorry to say, is going to be instinctively you know, less uh, crucially important than it was when it was at the heart of the European Union. Uh, Europe itself collectively, but you know, the main capitals, Berlin, Paris and Rome and so on, uh, will be important pool, ports of call uh, for the president. Uh, so it's going to be different. Uh, Biden is clearly on record as having said that if he'd had a vote, he would not have voted for Brexit because he doesn't think it's good for America or good for Britain and so on. But uh, there is an awful lot in the relationship between the, the two countries, which is of real value. And the incoming president has got a lot of experience of UK intelligence cooperation, cyber work, uh, foreign policy coordination, the stuff we've done to do together militarily in different parts of the world. And there are strong relationships speaking the same language and so on. Don't forget, of course, that he is fundamentally Irish Catholic by origin, although he's partly British as well. And that Irishness is an important part of who uh, Joe Biden is. But I think that there's long experience of working with the United Kingdom. And I think Sajid Javid is right to say that there's lots of potential for working together. Whether independent global Britain is going to be the powerful partner that we would all like, I think remains to be seen. We've got work to do on our side, I think, in the United Kingdom. But there's lots to play for, even though Biden and people around him are very aware of the fact that our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and members of his cabinet were very, very keen to lush up Donald Trump while he was in the White House. Um, well, I too am Irish and Catholic and from Northern Ireland, so I'm drawn to the question, which is whether <laughs> Boris Johnson's actions in regards to the handling of Brexit have been injurious from, uh, in other words, the trust factor between president and prime minister. It's not a great starting point, is it? I think it could have been very damaging. And there were tweets both from the incoming president and from his uh, future secretary of state, Tony Blinken, warning the British government about breaking international law and messing with the Good Friday Agreement. You'll remember that from just a, a few months back. But in the end, because yes. there was a deal and because the threats to break international law did, did not materialize, I like to think we've dodged that bullet. But uh, it was a very clear message that for this administration, and, and don't forget that Joe Biden, you will know this, uh, was one of the four key Democratic senators who formed up President Bill Clinton in the mid-1990s asking him to take a risk for peace and invite Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness to the United States. So he's got a lot of form about concerns of everything that goes on in Ireland and Northern Ireland. I think at the moment we're fine. 
Uh, it could have been a bad moment, um, but let's hope that uh, all the workings as far as the Good Friday Agreement are concerned uh, uh, work well and are not damaged by the new arrangements that the UK is putting in place to make Brexit work. I was reading one article, Peter, I, I, I'd like your take on it, which is, you know, Britain needs to, as it were, establish itself in a new vanguard outside of Europe, outside in, in its Brexit position. And it can possibly appeal to the Biden administration in terms of how it handles China relative to its European peers. I think it was a political piece. Is, is that an Arivest moment of where Johnson can appeal to Biden and really show a unique proposition to him? My view is that all by itself, outside the European Union, the United Kingdom is going to have to work a lot harder to have an influence on that kind of big international global issue like addressing the rise of China. Uh, yes, we've got plenty of brilliant diplomats. Um, yes, we've got experience of dealing with China. Uh, we've had what we called the golden era, which uh, hasn't lasted all that long. And we've got a number of issues relating to Hong Kong, to human rights. Uh, the British government's going to want to take a position on the Uyghurs. Is that or is that not genocide? And so on. But the idea that the UK on its own can make a big difference in terms of how the Biden administration will handle China, you know, I think that's a little ambitious. That said, I'm very clear that the people who the incoming president has appointed to deal with foreign policy, international relations, climate change, trade, the rest of it, and China, these are all people who are essentially uh, collegiate. They want to work with allies. They want to work with the like-minded. So yeah. to the extent that we've got something that helps them uh, make a difference, helps them rally the international community with China rather than, I would say, against China, so that we can move forward in a way that is, is to some extent, uh, collegiate without being naive, then I think, yes, the Brits can have something to offer. But the mere fact that we're outside the European Union and on our own and trumpeting something called Global Britain on its own is not going to make the difference. We're going to have to put something on the table which people say, huh, that's, that's important, good. Well, the Brits have got something to offer. Let's engage. It'll be interesting to see what, where, where that rises up, whether it's on the security front. Can, one closing question on Europe. You've mentioned um, the UK outside of Europe, but if I look, Maria is our cracking reporter on the ground in Brussels. She chases them all around. The phrase that she brought to the table, Peter, the other day was strategic autonomy, that this is the phrase that is being used within Europe in regards to uh, perhaps the relationship with the United States of America. He's got a lot of work. Biden has a lot of work to do in regards to healing the trust rift with Europe as well. They have their strategic autonomy. Why should they, I suppose, really cozy up to just four years of Biden, possibly? I think you're right. That there is a, a lot of healing of the trust rift, as you put it, that needs to be done after the last four years. Uh, there's a very important reset going on. I think we're going to get a, a different tone very quickly. But damage has been done because we have had a systematic kind of destruction of the institutions and the alliances and the relationships which have helped keep the peace and keep the world pretty prosperous for the last few years. And there are countries out there who have been close allies and friends of America who have been saying to themselves, well, OK, but you know, how, do we, how do we trust America? Because look what Trump did to the Iran agreement, look what he did to climate change, look what he did to the previous commitments of other presidents. So there's a, there are issues there to be addressed. Strategic okay. autonomy, I don't really know what it means, but I think Europe is going to want to have its own opinions. And the last thing I would just say is that from the UK's point of view, uh, we won't be totally outside because I do think that the E3 relationship in particular, which is a very important part of our foreign policy, working with the French and the Germans, I think that's going to remain a pretty important part of what we try to do together with our close neighbours.